So, I'm writing a novel is the show where you join me, Oliver Brackenbury, on the journey of writing my next novel, from first ideas all the way to publication and promotion. In this unique one-man reality show, I'll share with you my ever-evolving thoughts and feelings on how I write, being a writer, and everything that entails at each stage of the process. I'll also answer listener questions and sometimes interview people who write fiction. If you're the kind of person who likes to learn how things are made and get to know the people making them, then this is the show for you. That novel I'm writing is still called Untitled Sword and Sorcery Novel. <laughs> it will need to change eventually, um, but it's tricky, you know, with titles. I have sometimes wanted to write a story because the title came into my head, and I've also figured out the title for a book like a couple of weeks before publication. So mm, we'll see what happens. You know, I've talked to you about the origin of the book, the short story, it sort of birthed it, the genre, sword and sorcery, the protagonist, a uh, big woman named Vo, the stories that I've been, or sorry, types and techniques that I've been looking at and playing with in the initial brainstorming, and last time was a compare and contrast between what I felt was an excellent sword and sorcery story that really does it for me, The People of the Black Circle by Robert Howard, and the opposite of that, <laughs> but that is still very similar to the first story in a lot of broad ways, Conan the Buccaneer by Lynn Carter and L. Sprague de Camp. So yeah, genre, protagonist, story types and techniques, a compare and contrast to better understand the genre and why I'm drawn to this. Already, we have a lot of pieces stirring around, along with a few things I actually haven't covered that are around this era in my outlining the novel, you know, several pages of stray thoughts, a brief study of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, because I was curious about Sword and Blaster, I, oh, and also some stuff about language and the role of race in fantasy stuff, all, all good things to talk about, but Right now, I'm going to go to the second project diary entry in the Denim Notebook where I'm doing all this. The date is April 4th, 2020, and at the top, I basically reiterate what I just said to you about like, okay, let's see what I've done so far. And then I also mentioned that I, in Scrivener, I have come up with a rough three-act structure for the novel Scrivener. What's that? Well, if you're not familiar, it is a writing software that I myself really like using for prose. People, including the people who make the software, like to say, oh, you can use it for screenwriting for reasons I won't get into because this isn't a screenwriting podcast. I find it kind of clunky for that, but I love it for organizing short stories and novels because it has a really neat sort of like file organization structure that allows me to break off everything into little pieces that I can then still keep under one umbrella, like one big file, rather than having a whole bunch of word files, one for each chapter, let's say, or one long word file that is just like an infinite scroll. I find that the Scrivener's way of organizing things works best for my brain and how I like to think. Plus, you buy it once. Anyway, in the diary entry, I wrote down after all this, now what? <laughs> <laughs> which is how I tend to feel after the initial sugar rush of brainstorming and picking the genre and figuring out the character and doing research and ah, you know, after that's all over and I'm lying on the carpet staring at the ceiling wondering what to do. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I could always do more research, and I, of course, did continue doing research past the point uh, in the diary where I am here, and I could certainly always do more just general brainstorming, but at some point you want to have some unifying ideas, a basic structure, you know, kind of an outline for the outline that you're writing. Ah, uh, see, I didn't say I want, I said you want, because that's how we like to speak. We like to speak didactically. We like to be telling everybody, this is it. This is how the world is. So I will once again remind you, this is me just sharing what works for me, where I'm at, at the time of recording. Not telling people explicitly how to do things, because I find A, I don't feel qualified to do that, and B, if I do that, if I say, hey, here's the fix for the problem, and you go try the fix for the problem, and it doesn't work, or it doesn't work every time, that that might leave you feeling kind of deflated, like, oh, I did the thing I'm supposed to do, and the, didn't get the result I wanted, uh, I think we've all been there. Right, so that is relevant, what I just said, not only to this podcast, but also where I was at, where I was saying to myself, now what? Because I, in thinking, now what? Was thinking, well... Maybe there's a book that can help me. Maybe there's a guide. You know, I've mentioned before, I think, in the podcast how I used to feel very antagonistic towards writing books because I just wanted to be creative and do whatever I want and not be told a story is in the shape of a triangle or there are exactly 7.7 
five types of story and you are bad and wrong if you want to think outside of this you know guide or whatever you know that's very frustrating to me and it still is but i have learned to make my peace with it a little bit because you do want to look at some writing books the same way that if you uh, were you know if you had a doctor who was about to operate on you you would not want them to just be freestyling it you'd want them to know something about surgeries that had been done before the surgery they're about to perform on you <laughs> So I try to be very picky about what books on writing I read. Here's my suggestion for how you could, you know, do what I do, maybe, which is keep an eye out for books that tell you this is the thing. This is how it's done. And maybe look more to books that say here are some tools that you can use and some exercises that can help you get a better idea of what works for you. Books in the former category can still be useful depending on your overall approach to taking advice from other people on how to write. I like to take the approach of thinking of my writing as like an ever modified tinkered with Frankenstein's monster that I just keep, you know, taking parts off, putting new parts on, seeing how it runs around that way and so on and so forth. And so if you're looking at one of those, you know, this is the thing books, I just go, yeah, OK, it's your thing. I'll check it out, see if there's any bits I want to pull off and then stick onto my monster. <laughs> For writing prose, the book I love to go to the most when I'm trying to organize my thoughts and really get like an outline-y, structure-y thing for writing the outline is Steering the Craft by Ursula K. Le Guin, which is a book based on her writing seminars, and it's been through many editions. Of course, you would want to get the most recent one, um, which I guess will be the last one because she's no longer with us. And yeah, I just think it's excellent. It's very much of the here are some tools and exercises school of thought in giving people advice on writing. I want to be more thoughtful about my writing while I create this book, and so that's part of why I'm spending a lot of time on the outlining and stuff, not just because, as it turns out, it gave me fodder for a podcast. <laughs> but of course, I also don't want to box myself in and overly limit my writing when it actually gets to the point of me writing chapters, so I will think of this as me kind of setting the defaults. Each time I sit down to outline one of the short stories, because I have set myself this sort of bigger task by writing a short story cycle where each story is going to need the kind of outlining work I'm about to do for the whole novel. So I'm going to think of it as me like setting defaults that I will start from. But if it makes sense with each individual short story to deviate, then I will allow myself to do that. OK, first up, what tense am I going to write this book in? This is a pretty easy one for me because I'm already trying out a genre I haven't written in and a whole bunch of other stuff that's new to me. I don't want to mess about and do like a really crazy experimental thing where I tell this all in the future tense. And the present tense doesn't feel right either, even though Sword and Sorcery is a very active, fast moving thing. So maybe present tense could make it feel more immediate. I'm going to play it safe and go with past tense. Everything has happened as I am describing it to you, right? Then there's the question of perspective. Now, most of the sword and sorcery I have read has basically been one of two kinds, either limited third person, which is where, you know, you're not inside the head of a character, but you're kind of sitting over their shoulder. And if like they're anxious, then the text should read anxious, you know, and the reader is privy to the thoughts inside that character's head. But nobody else's. We're sitting over their shoulder. Nobody else's. We can see in their head. Nobody else's. Now, you might hop over in the, like the next paragraph to be the limited third person perspective of a different character. But within that paragraph, you want to stick on that character. And it takes some skill to do that, to leap from paragraph to paragraph or page to page between people's different perspectives. You really want to make it clear to the reader that that's what's happening without explicitly stating it, of course. The other perspective I've mostly run into when reading sword and sorcery novels is omniscient, which I feel is like easy mode for the writer in the sense that you are writing from the point of view that you have as the writer. You are a god. You can see inside anybody's head. You can hop all around anywhere in the room, in the world, to various people's perspectives, and just all things are privy to you and therefore privy to the reader. That's what I did for my very first novel because, frankly, it felt safe <laughs> and uh, I didn't trust myself to not mess up if I tried to write in limited third person, which I then gave a whirl with my second novel. I think I'll mostly stick to limited third person for this book, but it, I did notice that the people of the Black Circle, that Conan story I love so much, pretty much it had to be omniscient to work the way it did. So I think I will allow myself to dip into omniscient when it makes sense whether for a page or paragraph or a whole story. I don't see myself using first person where you are, you are literally hearing the voice of the character that you are seeing the story through, unless it feels right, I suppose. 
And I really don't see myself using objective narrator or detached author, whatever you want to call on it, which is basically a fly on the wall. You know, there is no viewpoint character. Okay, so if limited third person is what I want to use mostly, then whose shoulder am I going to be sitting on for most of the time? Well, you would think Vo, but I really do want to experiment with showing you Vo through the eyes of others, and so I'm going to take this on a case-by-case -case basis. Definitely for the first third of stories, I see it mostly being various sidekicks, quote-unquote, that she picks up. I also think this is a neat move to try given that I'm doing a short story cycle. I want each short story to really stand alone, and if they're all from me sitting on Vo's shoulder, then that would, I think, bring a kind of sameness that won't be there if it's a different character each time. I don't see myself switching limited third-person point of view over and over within a story, though, because honestly, ever since Game of Thrones became a thing, I find that when I read a book, particularly a fantasy book that does that, it feels like the author is trying to write for the TV adaptation. And I think you should write for the thing you're writing for, even if I myself, certainly, uh, you would love to have a screenwriting career and or have your stuff adapted into film and television. Okay, the next thing I want to consider is the trajectory of the novel, which Le Guin defines in her book as simply, the trajectory is the shape of the story as a whole. It moves always to its end, and its end is implied in its beginning. Now, while each story I tell within this short story cycle will have its own little trajectory, the book as a whole should have one, right? It's funny because I'm following the life of someone who's trying to be a wandering hero, at least at the beginning. And so wandering, well, kind of goes all over the show, doesn't it? But there is that thing of Vo wanting to be a hero, which is really coming down to her trying to find purpose to figure out who she'll spend most of her life being. I see a hero as someone who prioritizes others, who lives for others, right? And so what does that leave? Well, there's living for others because you choose to. There's living for yourself, of course. And then I would say there's living for others involuntarily, like me working a job you don't like or being put into some kind of servitude. Oh, hey, that's three things. Maybe I can have three acts, which I know what I just said about TV. <laughs> but TV, first of all, does not have uh, TV and film does not have a monopoly on acts. Also, one, two, three, well, beginning, middle, and linear time. You can't escape it. If you know how, please let me know. <laughs> but yeah, everything's got to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Even if, say, you try to only have a beginning and an end, and so you just have an ill-defined middle. Well, guess what? You still have a middle. In the diary, this led to me drawing a kind of wacky-looking little diagram, which I'll have to put a picture up of on the Patreon. Yeah, did you know I have a Patreon? Please go to patreon.com slash so I'm writing a novel if you would like to support this podcast and the writing of the novel uh, financially. I would greatly appreciate it. And one of the things you get as a patron is access to blog posts that show more visual things that are less than ideal to describe on the podcast, but I'll give it a whirl. So yeah, in this little doodle that I did, I've got a first act where she's trying to be a hero. I literally wrote adventure and put a dot with the island that she escapes at the end of the short story and the dotted line going to what it would be the turning point, right? How does the first act end? Why? And so I just wrote literally turning point and 25th year. That's about how old I want her to be by the time she gets there. Then I kind of used highlighters to demarcate the page a bit. Again, you go to patreon.com slash so I'm writing a novel to see the drawing. Next up is act two, of course, where I continue drawing the little dotted line like I'm doing the Indiana Jones traveling across a map thing where I put like, oh, hey, life, love, battle, big cities. Yeah, because this is where, you know, she turns away from heroism to live for herself and it's somewhat hedonistic. This is also where I see the energy of the stories being much more heightened, more like a Conan story or a Fafford and Grey Mouser story. We're just like, you know, let's go hog wild here, folks. Things may have been a little more limited where Vo was figuring out herself and learning the language on the mainland and all that stuff in the first act. But now she's ready to go, man. She knows what she's doing and she's doing it for herself. But of course, this too needs to end. And so we get a turning point that I mark on my little map that I'm doodling in the notebook here where we go into her 30th year. Let's make it five years and act. Why not? It's easy for me to get my head around and I can always change it later. Okay, on we go to act three. Now I can already see some stuff that changed since I wrote this back in April 4th, 2020, but I want to take you through the whole journey. So I'll tell you how it was. How it was is that I wrote, uh, okay, she's back on track. You know, the, the first act, she's hunting that wizard, remember, who trapped her people on the island. Second act, eh, screw that. I'm going to live for me. But then in the third act, she's back on track. 
but she realizes that as is, she could not defeat this wizard. She's not even sure where the heck the guy is. She needs help, and so this is the whole thing of serving others, perhaps involuntarily. The involuntarily came later here. I think it was voluntary. Serving some kind of supernatural patron, some kind of god or big demon or the ghost of another wizard. Who knows? I'll figure it out when I get there. I know the basic idea, though. She's serving others in exchange for what she needs to achieve her ultimate goal of taking revenge on the wizard. In this sense, Vo becomes a bit like certain Greek characters. Of course, we all think of Hercules performing his 12 labors. I hope it was 12 labors. I'm not going to check that right now because I want to keep recording. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but I'm mostly thinking of Elric of Melnibony. Hope I pronounced that right. Written by Michael Moorcock. That guy, he is almost always performing some kind of duty for someone else, despite the fact that he is first an emperor of a great people and then, uh, you know, a former emperor who nonetheless has a great deal of pride within him. I really like the dance he has to do, juggling Faustian bargains with various and sundry, as well as being sent to all kinds of bizarre places in order to get what he wants in exchange for doing certain deeds. I think that's a fun escalation also for the story, and like I say, it's kind of a variation on what we have with Vo serving others intentionally on her own behalf, basically, in the first act, and then just serving herself in the second. So, okay, power, info, confidence to confront the wizard, achieved, I write, with a little dot going to the second half of the third act, the path to the wizard, and then her actual ultimate destination, which is her changed outlook on life that she will carry with her into a hypothetical sequel, or maybe just off into the mists, if I don't write it. So there you go. There's my trajectory for the novel. If it sounds like it's all over the show, kind of is, because it kind of is. And I'm trying to also leave room, right? Because in each of those acts are going to be a bunch of short stories, each with their own trajectories. I got to be careful. But at least I know where she starts, where she ends up, and the major turning points along the way. Great. Next up, focus. Basically, what's the focus of the book? And I wrote here, you know, this book is about the adventuring life of Vo, her quest to kill a wizard who nearly doomed her people to never being able to leave the island and how she changes as a person along the way. It's also kind of about the legend she creates along the way. Pretty straightforward, nothing to explain there. What was maybe a little less straightforward for me was thinking about theme, or even a thematic conflict. Because to imprint the same theme across every short story, making up the legend of Vo, would make it kind of monotonous, right? Like if every single short story was about pride. Now, a thematic conflict is a different story, because, you know, a thematic conflict is like a big question that can't really be answered, but it can be like in one definitive way, but you can answer it a whole bunch of different ways and it can be just constantly explored over and over and over again. This is a thing I mostly know from television. And a classic example of a thematic conflict that can drive a long running series is, you know, how do you choose between your personal desires and your obligations to the world at large? I mean, think about how many heroes you've seen wrestle with that and how often you've seen them wrestle with it. But I see in my diary entry here that I was very wary of overly constraining things, so I chose to, you know, put that on the back burner for now. I'll have themes or thematic conflicts for individual stories, but for the whole novel, I don't know, maybe that's something I'll figure out looking back over it. And that can happen. You can write a thing and then be like, oh, I see, it's about this <laughs> on the back end. It's okay. Past uh, our trajectory that I just discussed, I can't imagine a single plot over the whole book either, as it would demand continuity that would break the concept of the short story cycle itself. In Steering the Craft, Ursula K. Le Guin defines plot as a form of story that uses action as its mode, usually in the form of conflict, and that closely and intricately connects one act to another, usually through a causal chain, ending in climax. And then I wrote here in my notes, people of the black circle, because boy, does that story ever do that. And yeah, you can see why that wouldn't be compatible with me stringing a bunch of short stories together, because then they'd become chapters in one big plot, right? However, I am telling one big story, which Le Guin defines as a narrative of events, external or psychological, that moves through time or implies the passage of time, and that involves change. And that's one of the key things here, right? I've got Vo on a track where she's changing, at least at the end of each act. <laughs> And hopefully at the end of each story as well, though that might not be the case with some of the ones in the middle there in Act 2 where she's a bit more classic sword and sorcery. We'll see. Coming back to that word, conflict, I think I agree with Le Guin's point of view, which is that it isn't the only thing that drives stories, but we are taught like that a lot, especially with screenwriting, but I think in prose as well, you know, everything's conflict. If it's not conflict, it's not interesting. She reminds me, and I remind myself by writing it again here in the diary entry, that there's at least a few other things that happen with people that can be really satisfying moments or drive stories. Relating, finding, losing, bearing, like just bearing something terrible. 
discovering, parting, and changing. Relating, finding, losing, bearing, discovering, parting, and changing, as well as good old conflict. Rounding out the four pages of notebook where I wrote all this stuff to help guide me in the writing of the novel and the writing of the outline for the novel, I cover a couple of things very quickly here. Secondary focus, because the book isn't just about the adventuring life of Vo, her quest to kill the wizard, etc., etc. I put down here that Vo rejects fate and destiny, biological determinism, and the idea of linear history, so too should this novel. Well, looking back at this now, I would say no, the novel doesn't have to. Your novel can disagree with your character, obviously, but I want it to basically agree with Vo, because <laughs> those are the ways that I feel. I then went on to write a warning to myself, saying it's also tempting to have her resent and reject unearned power, but would that put us in too much danger of retreading Junkyard Leopard, my first novel? Because that's absolutely a big part of what that book is about, so I'm going to have to be careful there. I don't know that there is a tertiary focus, like a third kind of focus, that's like the least, but it's still there. But I do like the idea of like recurring imagery and motifs, you know, maybe uh, as a rose pattern dress or blouse always indicates trouble for Joan on Mad Men. What uh, imagery follows Vo? Islands could represent being trapped. Smithies and looms could symbolize home and parental love because of what her parents did. The hammer, you know, she wields a big war hammer. Uh, the hammer brings order. It can create and destroy. Hmm. We should play with this as we go along, I write down. <laughs> Maybe I will. I'll pass Oliver. Maybe I will. Okay, so there you go. We've walked through what was essentially me creating the outline for the outline or the outline for the novel or both, depending on how you want to look at it. I sometimes think of it as kind of my lighthouse. Anytime I feel lost in the story, I can go back to this document, these few pages in the notebook and find my way again. Now it's time to find my way over to a listener question sent in from Jason Lever of Toronto, Canada. Hi there, Oliver. I know working with a story editor is an important part of your process, and that's something I've never done. And I'm wondering, how is it you know when you're ready to go to that step? And how do you find a story editor? How do you find the right one for you? Thanks, Jason. Um, okay, I'm going to answer this backwards. I'll start with how I found people. So yeah, it varies a little bit, but it all kind of comes down to networking. With my first novel, I really didn't have any money to spend on it. Not really. But I got lucky because I had been talking about it through the process with my friend Jackie. And when I had a first draft, you know, I said to her, hey, you've mentioned once or twice you might want to try editing a novel. Would you be willing to try editing mine? Uh, just, you know, go through it and give me your thoughts about the story at the various stages. And I could give you X dollars, which believe me, X was an honorarium. It was not a proper wage, but it was what I could afford. And I was upfront about that. I said, look, this is what I can do. This is what I'm asking. You've expressed an interest in doing something like this. What do you say? And she said, yeah, OK. Um, she could have said no. And then I, you know, that would have been me. I would have been kind of stuck at that point. <laughs> um, but yeah, so she did that and we had long conversations and she annotated a printout that I provided her with. And it was a good time overall, I'd say. Jackie really helped me out. The next novel I did, I had a little bit of money to spend, the entirety of what I had earned from the first novel. And so I sort of was like, OK, I'm going to try and find a pro, you know, like uh, Jackie was too busy for sure. And I didn't want to keep bugging a friend for this. Luckily, I had met someone who edits books for a living at a friend's party. So I reached out to them. They said, honestly, I would love to help you with your book, but it's not the kind of genre that I work in. However, I can give you a recommendation. So there you go. Networking again, I got a recommendation to an editor who I could afford and who did a very, very good job. I still have my printout of all their notes for that novel heavily annotated by me. And while I haven't yet, I've no doubt I will refer to those notes on the previous novel at some point for my work on this one because it had a lot of great lessons that carry forward. Personal recommendations are also how I've met all of the story editors I've worked with when I've worked with them on screenplays. But it wasn't a recommendation when I found a story editor to work with me on Vo, the short story that birthed this novel, the notes on which you can hear me read and discuss in the first episode. That actually was unexpected because it just, first of all, it just had never occurred to me to even find a story editor to work on something that short. I don't know why, it just didn't. 
But as it happened, one of the people I interviewed for the other podcast I host, Unknown Worlds of the Merrill Collection, where each episode I interview a guest about an aspect of genre literature history and how it connects to the present day. That's Unknown Worlds of the Merrill Collection if you want to hear me interview some people about that. Yeah, one of my guests in our sort of chitter chatter after the episode was over revealed that they were doing some editing work, including short stories. And I was like, oh, really? Cool. I'm in the middle of one and I'm kind of, you know, maybe I would like to get your help on it. What's, what are your rates? You know, oh, they're that much. Sounds good. Cool. Okay. And so, yeah, that's, that's how I found them. I'm afraid I have no experience in finding an editor just by like looking through online listings. I'm not even sure if there are such things. It strikes me that Twitter might not be the worst place to look, though, actually. I mean, every writer is on there pretty much. I wouldn't be surprised if you would find every editor as well. And so maybe you could do some searching based on genre. Certainly you want to have an editor who is familiar with the kind of stuff you've written, right? That would be part of how you would find the right editor for you. Otherwise, honestly, I, I don't know how you could beyond um, you know recommendations from people you trust and working with them, just finding out what it is like to work with them. That short story that I got edited, I was thinking, oh, this could be the right person for the novel that's coming down the pipe. I already had it in my head at that point. Maybe a short story is a good little test to see what it's like working with them on like 5,000 words before I commit to, let's say, 100,000 words. To the other half of your question, you know, when do you go to a story editor? Well, I have always tried not to go to one too soon. You don't want to just like get that first draft done, go bam, yeah, awesome, woo, go find an editor and send it their way. If only because it's probably going to have a lot of errors in it that you could fix very easily yourself once you've had a week off from looking at the damn thing, right? And even if you've been very thorough in your outline work in advance of writing that first draft, your idea of what the book is is almost certainly still a thing in motion and you want to really know what the heck it is before you go to an editor because knowing what it is will help them help you get to where you want to be. Waiting until you've got what you figure is like the next to last draft. You know, it's basically done, man. This is great stuff, but I just want to get a, you know somebody else's thoughts on it before I send it off to the publisher or send it off to the production company or if it's a screenplay. Well, I'd say that's better than sending it in too early for sure. But and actually, if you can afford to do it, if you can afford to have it looked at twice, then yeah, definitely have someone else look at it close to submission. You never know what new light they might cast in your story that might lead you doing a bunch of rewrites that will really improve it. However, I think the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. I can't tell you exactly what draft that will be, of course, because drafts are subjective. Some people make a new draft every time they fix a typo. Some people make a new draft only after they've worked through the entire thing and they can't think of anything else to do. And for some people, myself included, that spectrum of what qualifies as, okay, now let's make this a new draft, can change from draft to draft. What is more universal, perhaps, is a feeling you can kind of search for where you're like, OK, I've done uh, X amount of drafts of this thing. It feels like I know what it is. I know where I'm trying to get it, but I I'm having trouble getting it there. And also, I don't really know what I don't know. Right. That's where an editor can be really useful as helping you see things that you didn't even realize you were missing. I think if you wait too long through too many drafts, you might get to a point where you feel like, oh, I put all this work into it and I know what it is. So you'll be more resistant to an editor's feedback potentially. So, yeah, like I say, I think you should aim for the middle. And if you can afford it, OK, yeah, maybe pay a story editor to have a look at it again or have a different editor, you know, put, give their opinions on the thing when you're a little closer to being what you consider done. For anyone listening thinking, oh, geez, I don't have a lot of money. Uh, geez, do I have to get a story editor? Well, no, you don't have to. You don't have to do anything. And you can always look to a friend and see if you can work something out like I did on my first novel. Or you can just, just in quotation marks here, because believe me, this is a very useful thing. You can just get buddies to read the thing and give you their general thoughts. It won't be as thorough or as educated unless they happen to be a story editor, I suppose, um, as what you might get from a professional but it's something, man. It is something. So please don't feel priced out of writing. I Oh, my God, I hate it when I hear people say, oh, I can't afford to write a novel. Like what? <laughs> Maybe you don't have the time. But believe me, like financially, you should be able to afford it. If you're in the position where you can't afford, you know, a pack of pencils and a pad of paper to write on, then I think you've got bigger problems than not being able to write a novel. And I hope things improve for you soon. OK, so on that bright note, <laughs> I hope I've answered your questions, Jason, and I hope that these answers are useful for anybody listening. So I'm writing a novel. 
features original music by Gloria Guns and is hosted by yours truly, Oliver Brackenbury. If you'd like to submit a question, then please email it to so I'm writing a novel at gmail.com. Bonus points if you record yourself and send me an MP3 I can cut into the show. Doesn't have to be fancy. Using your phone is fine. Just keep it clear and concise. You can also holler at the show on Twitter. Look for at so underscore writing. At so underscore writing. Not what I said in the first four episodes, which was at so I'm writing a novel. I mean, that's like the name of the account, so I'm writing a novel. But the actual like handle at so underscore writing, I only just realized today is what it is. I typed in so I'm writing a novel and Twitter changed it to that. So yeah, I know what I'm doing. I am an adult. Please consider sharing the show with anybody who might like it, leaving a review on iTunes and checking out patreon.com slash so I'm writing a novel. Patrons get to be thanked in the final novel, listen to episodes of the podcast a week early, and even enjoy a bonus podcast called So I Wrote a Novel, where I read and comment on chapters of previous works, starting with my first novel, Junkyard Leopard. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I'll see you soon.